people. Like today again, we are celebrating Anzac Day. Do you know one of the most amazing things about Anzac Day is it actually celebrate. It was the Anzac Day was the first Australia and New Zealand military com- campaign in World War One. April 25th was being the day of the very first campaign of the landing at Gallipoli. For all intent, for all intents and purposes, Gallipoli was a failure. It was actually not a success. Their plans that they had of being able to get into a certain nation quickly did not go according to plan. And a significant amount of sacrifice was made. With over 10,000 Anzacs killed in battle, in this battle alone, and 56,000 Allied troops in total. I'll share more about the Anzacs shortly. Now, failure is obviously something that anybody in life wants to avoid. And certainly even for us as a church, failure is something that we would prefer to not walk down the journey of. So I want to take some time today to look at a biblical passage, some biblical history of some people who, so I think we can learn some lessons from. So how to learn some lessons from on how to not, how not to take your promised land. And it simply starts with this. Everyone go, but... <gasps> Oh, you got to do the hand thing. Okay, so it's but. That's it. Turn your neighbour and go, but. That'll make sense very soon. You see, because the, the people that we are about to look at, they missed something. They ended up in failure because of their inability to see and speak well about what stood before them. The Israelites, so last week we looked at Abraham. Abraham was the forefather of the Israelites. And these Israelites had been in slavery for 400 years. But God doing through 10 just mind-blowing miracles, like miracles that are beyond nature, beyond the natural, inexplicable can only be explained by that a supernatural force did these things. Ten amazing miracles took place that saw the deliverance of the Israelites out of slavery to the Egyptians, that saw God's people walk out of slavery into deliverance. And now they're on the move where we're about to look at them. They're on the move towards the promised land that had been prophesied to them, that they knew stood in history for them from Abraham, the land that was promised to Abraham. God has now brought them out of exile towards their promised land. Now, the interesting thing is that they get to the edge of their promised land. I wonder what your promised land looks like. I wonder what the sense of a promised land, of God's promises to you look like. Promises that perhaps you've not yet taken. Promises that you feel like maybe you've not yet taken ground on. But the fact that you're still breathing means it ain't over yet, baby. (laughs) I love the song that we sang, I think it was last Sunday. As long as I'm still breathing, God is still working. You know, it's really interesting to, even for us right now, uh, we obviously are on the edge to a certain large degree of a sense of our promised land as a church. There is a real sense for us as we move from being leaseholders. If you don't know this building, we don't own it, we lease it. In other words, we're basically renting it from somebody. Whereas now we stand on the edge of a promised land for us. A promised land of a building that has such significant kingdom history in our city. I don't know if you know this, but the actual Methodists who were the first one, who were the ones to have built this building, they actually were the pioneers to the Devonport region in holding church services. So this people who created the space that we're moving into, they themselves initially were pioneers to this city, feel somewhat similar. Pioneers in the sense that we planted this church, started it from scratch, and look what God is continuing to do. So let's come back to the, in Numbers 13, in Numbers 13, it records the moment where the Israelites are on the edge of their promised land. And they're instructed to go in and spy out the land. So if you're following along with the Scriptures, in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 1 to 2, 
It creates, we see the moment where God has actually said to the Israelites, to Moses, pick 12 spies, one from each tribe, to go out and spy the land. So they go out and do this, and then we can catch up in verse 27. They come back from being in the, the promised land for 40 days, 40 nights. And the 12 spies come back with this report. Verse 27 of Numbers chapter 13, it says, They reported to Moses and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Now, when they say this is its fruit, they had brought through a cluster of grapes that it says that was so large that it actually had to be carried on the, on the shoulders of two men. And so they're reproducing and having even evidence to show that the land is good. So everybody, just so I know that you're, you're keeping up with this story so far, because there's a bit in this story. Say to me, after me, the land is good. The land is good. All right, so the land is good. The, trouble, the thing is, again, with blessing, there's stuff. With blessing... There is stuff that comes along with it that actually has to be managed, that new skills have to be found. So this is the moment where we discover what I meant in the start. So everyone go, but. <gasps> Can you do the hand thing? It's really important. You'll understand why. Everyone, everyone go, but. <gasps> We're getting there. Spy on your neighbour for me. Make them do it. Everyone go, but. <gasps> <laughs> The key to how you take your promised land, we can actually see in what happens next. The 12 spies, they've seen the land. It's really, really, really good. Flows with milk and honey. What does that mean? It actually means the sense that, that, that there is cattle, that the land is great for cattle, for sheep, all this sort of stuff, for their goats, all those things. And then it flows with honey in the sense that apparently honey, from what I've read, was actually like a rare commodity in those days and therefore considered a special treat. So for it to flow with milk and honey means for these people, they know this is good. Verse 28, and here comes the part that we can all learn from. But, very good. The people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified, walled and very large. Moreover, we saw that the descendants of Anak, people of great stature and courage, the people descended from Amalek live in the land of the Negev, south country, the Hittite, the Jebusite and the Amorite live in the hill country and the Canaanites live by the Red Sea and all on the wall of Jordan. Verse 30. Then Caleb quieted all these spies and the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession of it. For we will certainly conquer it. But the men who, but, oh, here it is again. Here we go, but. <laughs> but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people of Canaan, for they are too strong for us. So they gave the Israelites a bad report about the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we went in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Then all the people that we saw were men of great stature. We saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their, so we were in their sight. This gets worse. As if this is not already bad enough, it gets worse. Read chapter, verse, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 1, which again you can follow along if you're following along on the app. 14 verse 1, it says, Then all the congregation of Israel raised their voices and cried out, and the people wept that night. All the Israelites murmured in discontent against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Oh, that we had died in the land of Egypt. Oh, that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land of Canaan to fall by the sword? Our wives will become plunder. Would it not be better us to return to Egypt? Everyone say, slap the weasel within. <laughs> the most incredible thing happens that when blessing comes is that you have two, number one of two options. Is that you can look at all the things that are available to you and all the blessings that it brings. But you can also then begin to notice the pressure that it brings. Talk to any sole trader who sees their business grow rapidly. 
And they can tell you about the extra pressure that it creates, the extra cash flow that is needed, the, the ability to get money back from the, the, the clients who you've done work for, and therefore the ability to go, how long can I keep going until that money comes through? They're just trying to get the accounting done. They learn the fact of now I've got more to organise. There's so much more to organise because of the fact that there's more clients. Oh, what do I do? Ow. What do I do? Well, you've got one or two choices. When we move into promises that God gives to us, we can either say, thank God, look at this blessing. Or we can start complaining about all the problems that are coming with it. When you go home, take a look at this scripture and look at the order of events. Numbers chapter 14, remember these, the majority, all the, basically all the people, they estimated somewhere in 3 million people. And all but 12 went in and spied out the land. 10, for some reason, decide to see all the problems. They then tell everybody all the problems. Three million people have not yet even seen the promised land. Yet they hear the report of the 10 and without even seeing it, they're creating a story in their head. They're creating a story in their head that hasn't even happened yet, that we're all going to die. It hasn't even happened. Yet they're crying out, they're moaning, they're groaning as if it's already the truth. If you've been in one of my sermons before, you would have heard me talk about fear is false expectations appearing real. When blessing comes again, you've got one or two options. Are you going to see the blessing or are you going to moan and groan about all the pains and the potential problems that come with it? If you want to know anything about mental health, mental health is the ability to stop those spiralling stories that are going round and round and round in your head that aren't even truth. If you would even just take the time to write down the stories that you've got floating around your head, have a look through the stories and go, this is fact, this is just a story, this is fact. I can tell you the majority of what you will write will be a story that you've created about something that hasn't even happened yet. Your greatest way to deal with that anxiety and depression is get real about the story and stop letting the story spin. Turn to your neighbour and say, stop letting the story spin. This is pretty important. I'll never forget a friend, of, a very good pastoral friend of mine leading a significant church in America. And I'll never forget his comment that he said to me once when he visited a conference that Sharon and I used to run over in Wynyard by the name of, his name is Jürgen Matesius. And he said, don't curse your mountains. Don't curse your mountaintops. Don't curse your, your glory, the, the blessings that God has for you while you are in the valley. What does that mean? Last week I talked about the sense of the call of God on our life. There's a sense to go. And I don't know where you're at with that sense of go on your life. I remember what it felt like. I was fortunate. I, my Christian experience began as a teenager. And I can even remember as a teenager that experience of that feel of the call. That, that God had plans for my life, which I know He has for you. I, I don't even have to wrestle with that, does He or doesn't He? The Word of the Scripture, the Word of God, the truth is... The foundation is God does indeed have a plan laid out for you. Blessing that He wants to bring you into. But there is a part that we play in our ability to agree with it. Because it doesn't matter what dream it is. It doesn't matter what call it is. It will have valleys. Life has valleys. You can't avoid them. It's just life. If you're breathing... I hate to prof. Who wants to prophesy? This is a pastor. This is a great prophecy for today, isn't it? If you're breathing, you're going to have a valley experience. Thank you. Thank you, pastor. Really appreciated that prophetical word. Valleys. See this again. This is where the stuff happens. It's in the valley. If we can learn in every valley to just simply go, when we start to want to tell the bad news story, when we simply want to say everything that's going wrong, 
if we could just find a way to go, but. <gasps> you see, what happens sometimes in the valley is that, that we speak so strongly about all the problems. We speak so badly about what we're starting to think and feel and all that sort of stuff is that we end up cursing the potential of what God wants to do in us. Because we come so adamant about God couldn't do this in me, God can't do that in me. Oh, my life is not going to be this, it's going to be that. Oh, it's so good, it's not, ter- it's not good, it's terrible. It's not... Somewhere on the way, you've just got to find a way to go, but I love it. Because what you and I are called to do, that even in the valley, that we still find a way to praise God. Ezekiel chapter 37 talks about a group of men who they were a group of soldiers. They were out. They got caught in a valley. They got stuck and it became the valley of dry bones. It's amazing what happens and I can't wait. I should stop. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's a little bit in the next few minutes. Psalm 23, one of the keys that David gives to us is that when you go through a valley, just keep walking. Don't stop in the valley. And the third thing to do, what Habakkuk says in chapter 3, is that even when everything is going wrong, still choose to say, but I will praise God. Habakkuk 3.17, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Anyone getting depressed yet? <laughs> yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. I can't wait to finish this message. There's so much good stuff in this. But let me tell you how this relates to us in our move from here to there. Because I want to help give you a little bit of a heads up. Because I want you to understand we are moving into a promised land. And our promised land has a few buts. <gasps> so I thought maybe if I pre-warned you, I can help you understand to help us that so when we take the promised land, we know how to take it. You see, there's one thing that you're going to notice fairly quickly when you get into this building. There's no heating and cooling yet. <laughs> See, I can already see the, I'm so glad I've pre-warned you. I can feel it already. <laughs> I will never forget when we were negotiating for this space. When we were like, oh gosh, it's over five years ago now. When we were first negotiating for this space, I can still remember sitting with the, the landlord and saying to him, look, uh, we don't have the finance for this, but one of the conditions of us taking this place is I want these things. It's got to have heating and cooling in it. And because Tasmania being what it is, and particularly the stage of church life we were at then, I go like, I know we're going to need, we're going to need heating and cooling. But I can't make that happen for you in this one. I can't get that set up beforehand because of the costs that are involved, that are extra, that are more than, than what we've currently got budgeted for. Our budgets at the moment are to take this building. So one of the things that we're all Tasmanian here, though, are, you know, for those of us who've been in Tasmania long enough. We know that when we hit winner, what do we do? What a great excuse to bring a blankie to church. I can just see it now one Sunday with oodies everywhere. I'm just going to declare it's oody Sunday. <laughs> But when we're going to go in there, we're not going to complain about the heating and cooling, are we? No, are we? No, we're going to go in there and go like, what opportunity has God created us for to get close to each other? So that's the first thing you're going to notice. The second thing you're going to notice. Oh, I don't even know if I want to tell you this one. The toilets are a mess. Oh, that was not so funny, is it? You're all going to go, I don't want to do that. What do, we, what do we do with that? What do you mean the toilets are a mess? There is a block of toilets. The main toilet block has not been touched, we reckon, for somewhere in the range of maybe 20 plus years. Oh, you can feel it. Right? You can feel it, can't you? Now, 
Now that I've said that, let me just un- unveil it a little bit. Look, there are at least three really nice brand new toilets, which actually meets council requirements, believe it or not, of what we actually need to redo, what we need to have for us meeting church in there. We get a few extras of being in church sort of thing. Um, so one of the things, obviously, somewhere on the way is that we're going to have to go to work is, is that we're going to have to work on the toilets. We'll eventually have to spend money in there, get all that cleaned up, make it really sweet, really nice, all that sort of stuff. But again, when we go in there, we're not going to complain about it, are we? Because we're all going to go, but. <laughs> and I still don't even know how to put a positive spin on that one yet, Terrence, right? I was still just going like, God, how are we going to do this one? You're God, so I'm all good. It's okay, we'll work it. <laughs> it's going to be a great way to connect with our neighbours. Can I use your toilet? (laughs) (laughs) I hadn't thought of that one before. (laughs) That just came to me. Anyway, that's right. Revelation, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. All right. Okay, so number one, and I'm not going to reiterate them actually. All right, there's one more that I really want to make sure that you're aware of. And that is that when you go into this building, there's another thing that you're going to notice very quickly. It's just nowhere near as big as this. It's smaller. We're going into a smaller congregation space. We're going into a smaller building space. Just, it's actually smaller. <laughs> Someone's already jumped in up the front and just said, oh, less cleaning. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we are so privileged with how God moved for us here in this space. And I really want to take a moment to thank David, Mary and Beswick in particular because for us to have this whole centre and the access that we've had to it is because another couple, took, they stepped out. They stepped out. They saw the vision. They saw the possibilities of what could be. They saw the fact of how this could work for church, for business, for reaching a community, for connecting with our community. And I, again, want to say thank you to them because that's enabled us to have such a massive, massive space into our city. Can we take a moment just to thank David and Miriam again for the incredible work that they did and have done. But now God is positioning us for a promised land that we get to have a, a we getting to not again, not be leaseholders, but landowners in this city, that we actually get to take possession of something that's not just any building in our city. We're actually about to take hold of something that has kingdom history, kingdom value, kingdom purposes. And I so believe for the, the purposes that it was created for, that all those years ago, that those pioneers saw people coming to Christ, seen a revival break out through our city, seen a move of the Spirit of God coming to our city. They're going to see it. Yes. They're going to see it, but unfortunately it wasn't those who were in it before. But I believe that what God wants to do through us, that God wants to do through the C3, C3 tribe, that for such a time as this, He's opening up a promised land for us that He will use to bless this city with. If you believe it with me, say amen. Amen. Which brings me to the, okay, so we've looked at how not to take your promised land. Everyone go, but. But let's then look at how to take your promised land. You see, the most incredible things about the Anzacs, the Anzacs became legend because of their mateship, their camaraderie. That even in the face of fear, even in the face of literally the, their life to be taken, the greatest price anyone can pay for their country, for their loved ones. In the midst of, of, of this fear, they found a way to still have courage, camaraderie, and a mateship that made them legend. That not only made them legend, but has become the legend of Australia. And that who we are regarded as a people of the way that we stand one with another. So here's the key to taking your promised land. The only way you can experience that is in community. The only way that you can have that is by the walking together. Healthy disciples are kind and healthy disciples understand that we come together as the church. Say to your neighbour, we come together. But this is this incredible thing that we do when we come together. And that is that we become the people who, you see, because we were created to declare the things that God calls good. We were created to declare what He has called good as good. We were created that when someone 
beside us is struggling and we can hear the but this, the but that, the but all these other things, the, but, but the, that when we hear that, that we get beside and that we become the Spirit of God for them, that we become the voice that begins to declare to them, it's going to work for you. Because all things work together for good for them who love God and are called according to His purposes. We get beside them and we declare into them, greater is He, the Spirit of God in you, than he that is in this world. We get beside them and we say, I know it looks like a dark day now, but I know that as you keep walking, that the Spirit of He who overcame the world is the same Spirit inside of you, that you are more than a conqueror. Oh, but I don't feel like a conqueror right now. It's not about what you feel. It's about the truth of the Word of God. And I'm here to declare into you, to declare into you the truth. Truth is not based on how I feel. Truth is based on the Word of God and what He's placed inside of you. Even if you can't feel it in that moment, that is not truth. Truth is the Word of God and what He declares about you. And the declaration about you is that you are His son, His daughter, who He gave His life for. And if He would die on a cross for you and I while we were still sinners, how much more now we've said yes? How much more will He do? So therefore, our declaration to one another. But again, this can only happen in community because it's in community we see each other. And it's in community that we declare into each other. Help me out right now and declare to your neighbour, you're going to make it. Declare to your neighbour somewhere else, you are more than going to make it. Someone else around you and say, I can see the call of God coming to pass in you. Come on. How tall is it? Can you cope with a little bit more? Just a little bit more? When we, when we think of Anzac Day, we think of a fighting spirit. When we think of our Anzacs, we think of a spirit that fought. And if there's all things that I know that God, I, I believe that as I read the Word, as I think of my own Christian experiences, I think of those, the leaders who have gone before me that I've listened to, is that of all things that God wants to develop in you, is a fighting spirit. The more than a conqueror. Paul says this incredible statement, oh sorry, James says this incredible statement that is, that, that, that is, it is a journey to embrace it. And it says that consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because in the midst of your trial, God is at work to develop something incredible inside of you. God, I believe, wants to develop in each and every one of us the fighting spirit. So healthy disciples begin to discover that the fighting spirit is embraced in prayer. When Sue West read out the Lord's Prayer before, when you read through Scripture and you see some context around Jesus talking about prayer, it's not actually some soft thing. When Jesus talks about prayer, He tells them, and this is how you should pray. Pray like this. One example is of a neighbour. He has some beautiful people turn up, some long lost friends. They turn up to his house but he, he, and he wants to be the great host. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't have food. He wasn't, didn't know they were coming. They just randomly dropped in. But he remembers that smell from earlier in the evening. My neighbor's got bread. My neighbor cooked up this great meal. I'm just trying to think of, you need to think right now whose house that was next to you. Whose house next to you? Who was that? Was it Beth Overton's house? Was it Chris and Ann's house? I think it was Sharon's house. no. <laughs> And, and the, the piece of history that Jesus, or the parable Jesus tries to illustrate, this is what prayer is like. He says that when you know that, go to your neighbor's house and knock on the door. And don't stop knocking on the door, because even though it's in the middle of the night and your neighbor comes out and it's kind of like they don't come to the door, they just, I don't know how it works, but like it's like they have these two-story houses or something. And they kind of reach over the top of the house and they see who's knocking at the door. and go, oh, it's my mate. Oh, that's kind of a good thing, but what the heck, mate, are you doing? It's midnight. He said, oh, I've got these friends, I need your bread. No, you wake up my family, go away. It's midnight. I'm off. <laughs> and, and, but, the, but what Jesus teaches is to keep going, keep going, keep knocking until your neighbor says yes. He gives another example of a widow who's been, it's like she's been robbed of what she's supposed to have. A judge has made a decision, he's been paid off. And God says to the, and Jesus paints the picture of this is what prayer is like. 
that the widow every day comes to the judge. Every day she comes to the judge and she reminds the judge, you've done the wrong thing by me. You know what you were meant to do. You were meant to give me my land. You were meant to vote for me because that's how this works. That's how the law system works. It was supposed to be for me. And she goes back again and again and again. A bit like our children. Maybe your children. They come back again and again and again. And it's hard to say no, isn't it? I don't know what it is about God. I, I, I haven't, can I have the band come forward, please? I haven't completely worked out what this is. But what I see in God that when the, the idea of prayer was, is that we don't just come once. We don't just come once and go, well, that didn't work, and then leave it. But there's something about a father who wants to develop a fighting spirit in you and I. That he wants us to find and to discover the promises. Everyone say the promises. Not about my wish list. Not about just what I think how it should be. But the promises of God that when I come into the kingdom, that when I come into the place of prayer, that I can go, that God, I've been bringing my tithe in week in, week out. You have said that if I would bring my tithe in, that, that, that my, my, my balm would be overflowing. You said that there would be more than enough in my house. Well, God, my house is not overflowing. It feels like I'm just going from paycheck to paycheck. But God, you have said. But God, you have said. Everyone go, but God, you have said. That's the right kind of but. Did that come out right? <laughs> That's the right kind of but. And there's something that God wants to develop in you and I to go, well, do you actually believe that the promises of God are yes and amen? And if they really are the truth, will you fight for them? Will you come before me as your good, good, good Father who wants to bring out a strength in you that possesses promised lands I know the journey I have walked to get us to this point I know the journey that we have walked to get us to be on the edge of our promised land as a church and I know what God has brought forth through moments just like what I'm describing where I understand that a healthy disciple understands what it is to declare that God, as a good, good Father, wants you to rise up on the inside to to discover the power of declaration that you and I indeed will take lands, take His promises, see your call coming to pass see your neighbours coming to Christ, see your friends, your family, whoever it is that you pray for, that as we storm heaven, that as we, there's another scripture in the Word of God that I've always struggled with. I've, I've struggled to understand its truth and I don't even know if what I'm about to say is its truth, but it helps me to understand it when I explain it like this. There's a piece of Scripture that Jesus says, and the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I think there's something about the kingdom of God where again, that God wants to rise in you and I, an ability that we would understand what it is to declare in prayer. Let Let me finish it like this. I do believe in outspoken prayer. I believe in out loud prayer. You see, again, if I want to bless my brother Ron here and tell him how thankful we are for his journey here in our church, for his commitment. We are, so much of what you see here in this building is because of a man who stood in the gap and said, I'll put my hand up and help. And even now, again, he's getting ready to do that. Now, how can he know that (laughs) unless I speak it? Because if I just stand here and go, did you get it? Great. There's something about the declaration. There is something that happens when we declare. I could preach on this for hours just with different verses, scriptures, etc. On what it is to, to the, the, how it is that we declare over our own life what we declare into our family, what we declare into our workplace, what we declare into even people around us. But of all things, I 
know that God wants to rise in you. In fact, would you, could everyone stand right across this building? What I'm about to pray is about a prayer of boldness. And I know even in saying this prayer, that's not necessarily where everyone feels yet at this journey that you can go to. But if you'd be willing to, again, embrace what I'm speaking about here today, that you would understand that, but <gasps> that you would understand what it is to declare, that you would understand what it is that, goes, that commits to, that even in prayer, that you're going to be that person that says, God, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. If you're going to be that person and you're willing to say yes to this prayer I'm about to pray, would you simply put your hands out in front of you? Just simply out in front of you and says, yeah, God, I, I'm that. I want him to be stirred. If, even if you're already like this, if you're saying yes to this, I appreciate, as I said, not everyone can move to this space. But my heart is that you would know what God has for you and that you would discover that strength of what He wants to bring inside of you. I believe in strong, healthy disciples. My heart is to move you to the kingdom that you fulfill the purposes and the calling that He had for you. And therefore, again, I invite you to this lifestyle of what it is to declare that God will bless and His Word is true. So God, I pray right now today for every person in this room. I pray for every person, God, that we indeed are the people who do not live with fear, do not live with a spirit of fear, but are those who will declare, those who will declare the promises of God to each other, even to ourselves and God that even before you in prayer that we would know that we know that we know we will take our promised land we will take that which you have possessed for us gone ahead to make ready for us God I pray for everyone here God we want to be those people we want to be those people we want to be your ambassadors your mouthpiece, your sons, your daughters. Come move amongst us, God, that we indeed would be those who move into your promised land. Everybody said, could you just all stand before God just for a moment in quietness, if you would not mind. I know we did this before with remembrance. But I just even want you to stand and just begin to let what is the promise right now for you? What is the promise that God has for you right now? Can it be real again? Can it be strong in you? Can you see it in such a way that says yes? Can you see it in such a way that you will fight for it? to this kind of church or Christ full stop to what it is to be a Christian and you'd like to know more about who we are and what we do then can I ask you at the end of the service to come seek out either myself or any of the people that you've seen across the front you know in fact the majority of the people here in our church you could ask but if you're not yet given your life to Christ and you'd like to find out more about what it is to be a Christian or if you just need to come back to Him, can I ask again in this state today, please ask somebody here. There's going to be some people up the front in just a moment that again, that if, if you've come today with a, with a need for prayer, that if you've come with a need for prayer, they're going to they stand out the front here and, and they're going to pray for you. So 
They want to bless you. They want to ensure that you have a sense that they've declared for you. So again, church, I thank you. I thank you so much for who you are and who you are being. I want to thank you even in advance with us taking our promised land for the way that I know already that you are going to get involved. I so look forward to doing nights with you and having lights on all over the place so we can clean it all at weird hours. And I also want to let you know something else when it comes to our building situation as well. Please note that at this stage we are committing to not do anything on Sundays regarding around the building. We believe in a principle of the Sabbath and it's got all sorts of different ideas of what it does and doesn't look like. But of all things that I've learned in building a healthy church and building healthy people, we want to ensure that all the work that we're doing through the week, that on the Sundays we get a chance to rest, replenish for all the work that we will then do again throughout the week. Church, let me declare, God is about to do something. God is doing incredible things for us. And I don't just mean the people at the front, I mean you, us. You're just the most amazing people. I couldn't wait to get to church this morning. Not because the church was on, because you were here. Because I get to see you. So uh, have a phenomenal week. Be a blessing one to another. And can I remind you that, um, again, if you could, those of you who are willing to help out, volunteer around the building to do what needs to be done, there's some sheets at the back of the building, if you, at the back of the foyer. You'll see them on the um, trestle tables that are in black. If you could please go there, there'll be a few of our volunteers there who will also answer any questions that you might have about the whole building process. In the meantime, could you turn to your neighbour and say, be kind. Your neighbour around the other side and say, God is with you and for you. Hey church, have a phenomenal week as I said. Be a blessing to one another and we'll see you here next Sunday. Amen. How are you? Welcome to our Anzac Day service today. We want to always, as we do, celebrate people's milestones, birthdays, anniversaries. So today we have an incredible, exciting day. Thank it you. is Mr. David Klingleffer's birthday. 21 today, I hear. I so, so huge happy birthday. Oh, we're supposed to hold it to the end, but that's all right. And we've also got two more celebrating this week. We've got Jenny Edwards and Megan Ellingson. So a huge happy birthday to happy you three birthday, this Happy birthday, everyone. Week. Yay! <laughs> if we have missed any of your milestones, whether that's birthdays or anniversaries, please head on up to our service desk at the back. You won't get a shout out until next year, but we want to get your details because Absolutely. we don't want to miss out on any celebrations. No, definitely not. But what we want to let you know, there is no youth on again tonight, which is so sad, except we want you to continue enjoying the holidays and know that we are back on the 2nd of May. So stay tuned, check out all of our socials. There'll be more information there. Awesome. And maybe you are wanting to know a bit more about baptism and you haven't been baptised yet. Yeah. We love to baptise people. We believe in being fully immersed, Absolutely. fully under. Um, so if you want to know more about that or would like to be baptised, head up to the service desk for more information or see Pastor Anne or myself and we would love to take you on that journey of next steps into baptism. We're looking at having a baptism service on Pentecost Sunday Wonderful. towards the end of May. So, so stay exciting. tuned. Now check out the video that is going to let us know what our new Bible plan is. Awesome. How exciting is that? Oh, we are so excited to be launching into a new series from Craig Rochelle, Winning the War in Your Mind. You know, in our part of the world, we have a beautiful part of the world that we live in, but especially coming into winter, you know, your mental health is so important. So as a church, we want to love you and prepare you well for this season coming ahead, especially after yep. a season of COVID. You know, Absolutely. there's so many reasons why we are excited for this Bible plan. So stay connected, listen to your connect group leaders. They will get you connected to it as soon as possible. Awesome, so good. Coming up in two weeks time, and we have Mother's Day and we love Mother's Day. So a bit of a little hint and reminder for all you dads out there, take your children shopping. Mother's yeah. Day is a great time to bless our mums and thank them for yeah. all they do. Honey, hope you've got your present ready. I'd like something too, Chris. Yes. <laughs>
<laughs> but anyway, Mother's Day, we love to dedicate babies and children Absolutely. to the Lord. It's, it's a way of just honouring Jesus and saying, Jesus, you are Lord of our life in every area. So if you want to know more about that and dedicating your little ones, um, any age, come and see myself or Pastor Anne or up at the service desk and one of us will be in touch with you soon. So that is happening on Sunday, the 9th of May during our Mother's Day service. So Thanks exciting. church. Bye. Bye. Hey, thank you for joining us in the experience that we call C3. Maybe today you've made a decision to follow Christ, to become a believer, to become a Christian. If that's you, we would love it if you would just do one more thing for us before this service is out. And that is to go to www.c3churchdevonport.com forward slash online. It'll be appearing on the screen. If you could go to that link and click the button that says, take the next step. We would love it if you would fill out your contact details there. Uh, and one of us will be in contact with you because we would love to pray with you, answer any questions you might have, uh, and to encourage you though in this incredible life-changing decision that we believe is one of the greatest decisions that you can make on, on this side of heaven. Yeah, absolutely. And we would love to, for you to feel like you belong in a place where that's watching us online or in a service. So we would love you to jump on again that same website and you can choose Get Connected and we will be able to give you some more details on how you feel like you can belong because we really believe that there's a place for everyone where they fit and where they belong. And maybe you've got any other questions regarding C3, you can find links there where you can send us in your questions and ask for more information. Can we make a prayer request? Yeah. Hey, if maybe you're watching here today and you're actually someone who lives within driving distance of Devonport. We would love to invite you to come and actually join us here in our physical location here every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. You are more than welcome to come and connect with us. At this stage, we still do ask you to register your intention to come. It's just yeah. what the government is still asking us to do. But we would love to invite you that you might come and experience what we call the C3 tribe, the C3 family. So thank you again for joining with us today. Yeah, God have, bless on whatever an it is that you're week. doing this week. See you next week. Awesome. Bye.